Hello and welcome back and that is right today we want to return to the subject of DIY NAS motherboards with this. This is the new MITX motherboard from CWWK aka Changwang arriving with the N355 twin leg processor that's also an N150 version. This follows a review that we made here on the channel around about a week ago of this mini PC here and I think a lot of users myself included would have liked to have seen this kind of hardware spec in something a little bit more viable a little bit more expandable, a little bit more capable, and that's what today's video is about. I'm going to go through what I like about this board and what I don't, and realistically, I've made a lot of videos like this in the last 12 months, and then, you know, I don't want these things to get stale, so rather than go through it point by point, let's mix it up a little bit. I'm going to go through everything I like about this board, and by the way, there's a decent number of things, but then in the second half of the video, I'm going to tell you about some things that at best I dislike, and at worst, piss me off. But without further ado, let's crack straight on. Now this board arrives, uh, as mentioned, in two different uh, configurations. The N150 version with no memory, just the CPU pre-attached on the board. Retails for about $174 there. And the N355 version, that's the i3 8-core version, that arrives at $288 there. Now I will say straight away, you can get it with a Johnsbo cooler there on top. And I'm going to tell you right now, don't bother. Wait to the second half of the video for that one. But the board itself is rocking out with either one of those processors and alongside that it arrives with six individual SATA ports there and two M.2 NVMe slots inside there both Gen 3. Now not everyone's in love with MITX motherboards I know it I just happen to be one of those people that actually genuinely likes them. I Don't get me wrong I'm aware that it do limit a lot of the kind of expandability from the surface area but a lot of MITX motherboards thanks to more mobile power efficient CPUs uh, being rolled out by the likes of AMD and Intel result in a motherboard that can actually be quite capable yet very compact. Alongside the six SATA ports I've just touched on and two M.2 NVMe slots there, the storage we'll talk about later on. If we talk about the ports and connections, there's a decent amount there, definitely more than we saw on that mini little CWWK uh, pocket NAS from last week. Uh, we've got a couple of 2.5 GBEs there. Again, normally I would rag on a NAS for rocking out with just 2.5 GBE out the gate, but because this has a PCIe scalable slot there, Gen 3 times 4, that's also cut for a larger board, that means that you know you have got the option to scale up to 10 GBE conveniently. So I'm going to be less hard on this given the price point and given the CPU profile there. Now, alongside that, we've got a bunch of USB ports, only one USB 3 port kind of weird i get it at least they've rolled in a bunch of usb 2s that was one of my early criticisms of this device over here that this one had so few usbs but just keep in mind they are usb 2 and on the inside there we've got the two usb ports there built on the internal of the board so you can stick a usb there for you know a recovery drive or you can use it for something like unray to mount your unraid now set up there also talking about mounting uh, there is on the rear here an sd card slot as well that allows you to add that again as a failover, as a recovery, as you know, the backing up config. Again, it's very limited in its scope in terms of storage and capability. And it, if CWK are watching this, I'd maybe think about including an SD card slot with this. It will cost you nearly nothing, and people will really like it. But nonetheless, I quite like for an MITX motherboard how much they've crammed on here, and I'm not going to be too critical of the 2.5 GB on its own. Next up, let's talk about storage. We can talk about the M.2 NVMEs first. We've got two slots there. There's nothing on the rear of the board. It's completely blank. And those two M.2 NVMEs are Gen 3 times 1. I could have just looked at the official spec pages, but I dug in with Terminal and found that both of them are listed. Um, regardless of what drive I put inside, they were downgraded to 3 times 1. So you're looking at around 8 to 880 megabytes per second potential throughput there. And when we did repeated 1 GBE, uh, sorry, 1 gigabyte file testing there within Terminal on both drives, both of them gave us, again, around 780 to 790 megabytes per second read and about 690 to 700 megabytes per second write. So not complete saturation, but I will say this is a very power efficient CPU. More on that later on. A number of you are going to be wondering, by the way, about the uh, M.2 NVMEs in conjunction with that PCIe slot. Some boards of this caliber, again, CWWK and others, what they sometimes do is share the lanes for the M.2 slot with the PCIe slot. I'm pleased to say that I was able to not only take advantage of both of them simultaneously with the device and the Unraid software I had installed seeing both the M.2s and the PCIe, but 
when I did install inside that PCIe slot this card, because later on I did do some 10 GBE testing and this has got two Gen 3 times 4 M.2 NVMEs on a times eight card, this inside that allowed me to perform repeated read actions on both the first M.2 slot and the PCIe mounted M.2 on that card. And shared together, I still saw a performance of around 700 to 720 megabytes per second on the onboard M.2 NVMe and mounted on the PCIe card between 2.4 and 2.5 gigabytes per second on that repeated one gig file. And now I wanna talk about the SATA ports there at the bottom, those six SATA ports there, six gigabit each against SATA three. And I'm pleased to say that they are funneling into an ASM1166, which again, isn't the best SATA controller, but it's by no means the worst. Uh, that PCIe controller I'm sure you can see here on screen is a gen three times two controller. But I will say that when we dug into the lanes earlier on, we found that it was uh, downgraded to three times one. So regardless of what you put inside there, keep in mind you are gonna be limited again to around that 880 megabytes per second total throughput depending on your RAID of course and whether you can saturate it and when we had that PCIe card installed with the 10 GBE output and thanks to that board being in a PCIe Gen 3 times 4 it eliminated any other kind of bottleneck that could have happened. Now again when I had six hard drives here these are um, Seagate iWall 4TBs I had six of those in a RAID 0 environment and I was able to largely saturate it between 56650. Again, when I went for some of the testing, uh, the 256 megabyte test file in AJA, again, we got higher, but again, it's very hard to get a read at that kind of block, uh, that kind of file size. But when we went into the one gig and four gig, we saw more realistic uh, transfers there, around six to 700 megabytes per second there. And when I went with the SSDs, we saw it fully saturate it, but again, not a huge surprise. Next up, let's talk about that CPU underneath that fan there. Uh, this is the Intel Twin Lake, the N355. Again, that is a newer generation refresh of the N305 that came before it. And again, available in the four core, but this is the eight core version. Eight core, eight thread, uh, baseline uh, one gigahertz performance that can go up to 3.9 gigahertz when needed. It also has 1.35 in, uh, gigahertz integrated Intel graphics on board as well. So a decent enough CPU, but just keep in mind it only has nine lanes to play with hence why there are slightly hidden bottlenecks when transferring between different elements of this device again we mentioned about the SARS going into the PCIe or the M.2s going into the PCIe again a lot of these are going to depend on the upgrade cards you choose to use but just keep that in mind it is a power efficient CPU it's not some Xeon or Intel core it isn't going to change the world but I will say that CPU did a good enough job for the price point and what this is rolling out with. So put it into perspective, we had four individual Windows VMs with a virtual CPU assigned to each of them and a gig of memory. And when we had the system running of all of those, they ran absolutely fine. We were running all of those VMs side by side, Windows uh, 10 VMs running fair and well, exactly what you would expect. Again, it's gonna depend on the complexity or the VMs, or dare I say, the containers that you choose to use. But nonetheless, they ran great for this. It's really a question of just how much my graphics card was able to handle during the recording process, which as you can see from these blurry recordings, could have been better. And for Plex Media Server testing, again, we are still investigating that now, but uh, when we did uh, get Plex Media Server running up on this via a container, we were able to run multiple instances of 1080p, 4K, and an 8K file with conversion thrown in as well, and the CPU only hitting around 60% utilization. Keep in mind, of course, several things. One, that was without hardware transcoding, very important, and secondly, that is very much going to depend on the quality and complexity of the media you choose to use. Hopefully you can see a lot of that on screen. But right now, we're still seeing Plex uh, servers, how well they're going to be able to take advantage of the hardware transcoding engine on that CPU, the integrated graphics. The reason being that my previous setup was already fine for the N305 when I was trying to run Plex Media Server test testing with hardware transcoding on this one, a lot of the iGPU, a lot of the plugins from Unraid and stuff like that, and the original uh, Unraid mounted uh, Plex media server container I created did not play nice with this immediately. So it's still very early days. This is a Q1 2025 release CPU. Again, I'm sure that'll be ironed out soon, but until the fix is completely in place and we've got knock it around with a few little testings in the background, I'm reluctant to talk about this thing fully in Plex media server at this time, but the video should come very, very soon. And throughout the course of all of the testing that I've touched on thus far, 
The power consumption on this wasn't too bad. The CPU on its own is rated between 9 and 15 watts TDP, depending with idle and general use. Now, for me, when I went with full idle, that was with the cooling fans completely disabled, only two SSD mounted, none of the hard drives via the SATA there, and I got it as low as 9 to 10 watts there, which for an i3, I corped pretty darn good. Now, when we had that CPU running with four hard drives connected and two SSDs, and that was with VMs running 30% uh, of the overall system resources being utilized, I got it about 30 to 31 watts. Again, when we got rid of the VMs booting up there and some irregular uh, numbers. Finally, when it came to heavier use there, I had um, all of the VMs running simultaneously across four hard drives and SSDs, and with all of the hard drives and SSDs being accessed at the same time, and about 60 to 70 percent of the cpu utilization i saw power consumption here around 30 to 40 uh, 39 to 40 watts there again we were hammering it to get those numbers again that i3 we've already seen from the previous generation can be very power efficient it is the baseline power utilization of having a, a lot of hardware in idle and just how well the system is able to sort of cool those off and put them in hibernation when needed still i'm quite happy with those numbers and frankly, I really like this board, I'll say right now. And you know, if that's all you came to this video for, I'll say right now, don't look at the time bar at the bottom of the screen, just carry on, don't look at it, don't look at it. All right, so you saw it. This board ain't perfect. Let's talk about the things I wasn't that keen on. Um, I'll say straight away, I get it, it's an MITX board, but this PCIe slot up here is way too close to these SATAs here. For a times four card, and again, don't get me wrong, you've still got about half the board to deploy a PCIe card in here, even when I was using modest 10 GPU cards like this one, it really got close to the individual SATA ports there. And if I went ahead with a SATA expansion card, it immediately overlaid onto the individual SATAs. Same went with any of the combo cards, same went when I went with that larger combo 10 GBE Gen 3 card. The point I'm making is, far be it clicking in, it's an ITX, so placement is always gonna be limited. If you're gonna go with that PCIe slot, keep in mind, Everything is so close together that you are going to be backing on directly to those individual SATA ports there. This could have been resolved if they'd gone with like an SFF fan out port there. We've seen in other boards which have allowed for four to six to even eight individual SATA connections to be connected to the board via just a single you know, 2.5 centimeter square port on the board that would have really freed up some of that space. But just keep in mind that those six SATA ports there and the PCIe are remarkably close. Next up, I said I'd mention it earlier on, when you look at this on CWWK's own website there, you see that it can arrive with this cooler. I didn't get this shipped to me with this cooler. I actually used this from another device I had knocking around and added the cooler on afterwards. This is the same one they send though. But no matter what way you place it, you are really close either to a bunch of transistors that live insanely close to the original CPU, or it's slightly overhanging that SATA, uh, sorry, the uh, sodium connection there for that uh, memory slot there, sodium DDR5, 16 gig. Uh, on top of that, just generally the placement of that cooler, again, it's, just a really a public service announcement i wouldn't bother buying the cooler that they bundle with this device buy your own silicon paste and get your own cooler there because the one that they're offering in these bundles is just too big and next up i touched on it there the memory now this i already installed my own 8 gig of ddr5 but just keep in mind this board does not feature ecc again this isn't something I'm personally that annoyed about, but I will say there are going to be people that need to know that before going for this board. The lack of ECC on this, not a deal breaker for everyone, not a deal breaker for me, but it might be for you. And as mentioned, if you are going to take advantage of multiple SATA drives in this, just keep in mind that if you do put a 10 GBE card inside here, as mentioned earlier on, because that SATA controller, that ASM1166, is on a Gen 3x1 lane, you are going to be throttled somewhat by the overall performance outside of 10 GBE, even though the slot there is 3x4, those SATA ports are never going to get out of 8.8.8 megs anyway, remember that. And this last point is less of a complaint, but more of a, you should be aware, but there's absolutely every possibility that they're going to roll out a 10 GBE equipped version of this. They've already done it. We've seen it from CWWK themselves, and there are versions 
of that N100 and N305 motherboard with 10 GBE already on the board. So I see no reason why that's not gonna be pursued with this board as well. But of course, keep in mind that will lead to question marks about whether you will take advantage of that PCIe slot there because there just may not be the lanes for it. They may, I don't know, reduce the PCIe slot there down to times two in order to afford a 10 GBE physical NIC on the rear follow-up for this. But if you're watching this way, way later than February 2025, maybe do a quick check and see if the N355 mobile like this one is available in a 10 GBE version first. But there you go, that's pretty much everything I've got to say about the Changwan N355 ITX motherboard there. Um, do keep in mind, again, as mentioned, we are continuing exploring this system and we are going to be running those Plex tests very, very soon. Just want to make sure that hardware transcoding is absolutely faultless before we go down that road. But what do you guys think? Did you purchase the N150 or the N305 version of this motherboard and get a bit of buyer's remorse? Or are you glad you held out? Or does this bring us so little in this recent refresh that you never really missed that in the first place let me know in the comments below obviously there is linked below a written version of this review that isn't if not if not already live then will be live very very soon of course there are links as well to get a hold of one of these yourself in the description so if you found the video helpful and if you were going to shop at those shops i've listed below anyway make sure those two things are true please use those links doing so will result in a small commission to myself and eddie here at nas compares it's just us and it helps us keep doing what we do but thank you so much for watching and i'll see you next time